I want to share from a thought, from a title, what it means to be a follower of Christ. What it means to be a follower of Christ. You know the decision to be a follower of Christ is the most important decision a person can can ever make in their lives. Getting married, having kids, career choices, albeit important, those things are earthly and limited to time. The decision to receive Christ has eternal implications that none of us can sidestep. We all are, are faced with this decision. And it's important that we make the right decision. And if we make the right decision, then the Bible says that there is a place for us in heaven. There is a place eternally with Jesus Christ that we will be as believers in Christ. Upon confession of faith in the Lord Jesus, the believer is really making a decision to be a follower of Jesus. Oftentimes, we join a church, but that's not the end all be all. That's a part of what we should do in order to learn how to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So this is not a casual um, decision, but a meaningful and a deliberate decision that we should make to be a follower of Jesus. I don't just want to be on a church roll, but I want to be a follower of Christ. Jesus says to his disciples who are learning to follow him, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Or choose this course that I've laid out for you, and you ought to choose this path every day. How many know that the choice to follow Jesus is a daily choice? We choose every single day to follow Jesus. You have to make it up in your mind that today, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow him in the way that I live my life, in the way that I conduct myself, in the way that I behave. Today I choose. And you make a decision for the rest of your life, but you choose it every single day. Now, to do this properly, and to be effective in your choice to follow Jesus, you must rely on the grace of God. Because how many know you can't serve God just in and of yourself? Well, we need the grace of God. It is the grace of God that saved us. And it is the grace of God that keeps us and sustains us. It is the grace of God that we draw upon and that we need to do all that we do for God. It was God's riches at Christ's expense. You know, that's what grace is. God doing for us what we could not do for ourselves in salvation and God doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves in life. Can the church say amen? How many know we need the Lord? How many know you can't make it without him? How many know without him you would fail? I would be like a ship without a sail, tossed to and fro, but he's my anchor. And I thank him for his grace. Tell your neighbor, I'm a grace baby. Now, in order to let grace work, you must know how the grace of God works. You, you want to let grace work in your life. Yeah, I know you got it going on in Jesus' name, but you need the grace of God. And in order to rely on the grace, you got to know how grace works. So let grace work by knowing how the grace of God works. Let's turn to Romans, the fifth chapter, verse number one. 
Romans 5, verse number 1. And uh, I've come to love this passage. It really, really tells us what we have received. Romans 5, verse number 1. And the word says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, you have been justified by faith and we have peace with God, meaning you have been declared righteous and you have peace now with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is what he did, it is the finished work of Christ on the cross that you now have been declared righteous and you have peace with God. Now that's precious. You have been declared righteous, meaning justified. It's just as if you didn't commit a sin, even though you did and even though you do. Even though you did and even though you do, you've been justified by faith. And you were, at in, you were an enemy of God, but now you are at peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number two. Verse two says that we access this grace by whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So this grace that we have access to, it is access by faith. Faith accesses the grace that you need for everything in your life. You want to know how to be a better wife? Grace. You want to know how to be a better husband? Grace. You want to know how to excel better on your job? Grace. For the believer, you want to know how to be a better friend, about a better person. You need the grace of God. But faith accesses the grace that you need for whatever situation you are facing in your life. Everywhere we turn, every place that we turn, we're facing grace. Tell your neighbor, I'm facing the grace. The Bible says wherein we stand, if you're standing in everywhere you turn, you're facing grace. The grace of God is on top of you, it's at the foot, it's going before you, it's working behind you. You need the grace of God. I'm telling you, that's how we operate as believers. We operate in the grace of God. It's the grace of God. It's God's favor. It is God's witness. It is God's, it's God's power. It's his equipment. It's what you need in order to do whatever in your life. You need the grace. By faith, we access the grace. And that's what we need to start aligning our prayers. In our prayers, we access the grace by faith. Tell your neighbor, I know that's right. How many know that this grace has brought you in Christ into Christ because you know let me let me let me make it plainer the Bible says that we have passed from death to life John 5 verse 24 it says what we pass from death to life when at the moment that you got saved you pass from death to life a lot of people think when you die you're gonna pass from death to life right? That you're going to go to be with heaven, right? Go be with Jesus in heaven. But the truth about the matter is at, at the moment of salvation, you pass from death to life. Meaning you are delivered from the power of darkness at that moment, translated into the kingdom of his dear son. At that moment, you're brought out of darkness into the marvelous light instantaneously you're made a child of God Jesus told the Pharisees he says your father is the devil the Bible calls him the God of this world you were children of disobedience but in that moment you were translated delivered transported into the kingdom of his dear son and made alive you pass from death meaning that you were walking dead and then you were made alive That makes you special. That makes you special. The Bible says we are adopted into the family of God. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That we have been given an inheritance and sealed with this Holy Spirit of promise. God has marked you for eternal redemption. You're just waiting on your new body. But you're already a citizen of heaven. 
See, you are in the world, but you're not of the world. You got to know who you are, whose you are, that you have been made a child of God. And that's important. And the reason why it's important, because many of us are living way below where we should. We're low living. We're low living. It doesn't mean that you are low life. But we're low living. Because if the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, he's made things new. But it says old things are passed away, but some kind of way we're caught up in the old life. It's passed away, meaning that it's dead, it's gone. It's bye bye. We, we, we don't live that life no more. But we're low living because we got caught up in the weeds. But the Bible says that we are in Christ. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That means that, 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 that where Christ is already positionally, you are seated with him. That's high up. That's up there. Last time I checked heavenly places, it's talking about high. It's not talking about carnal living, but it's talking about spiritual living. It's talking about pneumaticos living. It's, it's talking about understanding who you are, the levels of entitlement that comes to a son. It, it talks about the privileges that we have as kingdom citizens that we're no longer supposed to be tossed to and fro in, in this world, living low like this carnal living, fleshly carnal living, just, just doing everything that the world is doing. But the Bible says, I called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. So we are trying now to fit in where we don't fit in. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, that's where you fit in. But we're trying to fit in where we don't fit in. But that's where I belong. I belong in Christ. That's important. Because that means that when God sees you, he actually don't see you. He sees Jesus. How many understand what I'm saying? It's not that he don't see you, but I'm glad that he just don't see me by myself. Because if he just saw me by myself, he would have to take into account all my ways. If he saw me by myself, he would have to take into account my nasty attitude from time to time. He will have to take into account the habits and everything that I do that's naughty. Yeah, I know you got some naughty stuff. All this superfluity of flesh and carnality in these idiosyncrasies. But God sees us in Christ. So that means that when God sees you, he sees Jesus because you're his body. It means you have been covered by the blood of the lamb you see Jesus was the propitiation meaning that it should have been you being judged for your sin but Christ he became the sacrificial substitute for you and I in other words it should have been you on that cross but he took your place it was your sins not his that was nailed to the cross because he didn't sin but he says I'll accept your sin and I'll make the great exchange you take my righteousness all you gotta do is be understand that it takes faith it takes faith to access this righteousness that I'm giving to you that I died to give you how many understand what I'm talking about? So the Bible says, as Jesus is, so are we in the world. So Jesus, he tells us 
that he go to his father. But then he gives us his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit lives on the inside to empower us to be able to do greater works. Y'all understand that, right? Okay. So this is what Jesus tells us. And I'm not even going to go there. I'm just going to, can I talk to you? He tells his disciples who are trying to follow him, he says, listen, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So in the proposition, there is a command. The proposition is, if you're going to come after me, or really, if you're going to follow me, you got to come after me. If you're going to follow me, you need to come after me. Deny yourself, take up your cross, then you're ready to truly follow me. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? To come after him means that you have to have a willingness to seek him, elder. You got to have a willingness to seek Jesus to come after him. What means, which means this, is that you are choosing to seek after God every day. Subconscious, deliberate, intentional decision that you're making on a daily basis. So when I get up in the morning, Jesus is on my mind. Yeah, I got a project from work on my mind. But this thing runs in the background. Even when I ain't thinking about him, he's on my mind. Even when I ain't thinking about him, he's governing my behavior. Even when I ain't thinking about him, he's wording my mouth. Governing my decisions. But I'm seeking him. When I'm seeking him, the Bible says... When we seek after the Lord, we shall find. Knock, and the door shall be open. If my people, which are called by my name, they would humble themselves, pray, seek my face I'm reminded of the scripture it says draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto you another scripture says as the deer panteth for the waters so my soul longeth after thee they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. If we're going to follow him, the first thing we need to do is learn how to seek after him. See, a lot of people want to be on church rolls. They want their name in heaven but they don't want to meet the requirements because there is a command in the proposition that if you're going to come after me, to truly follow me, you got to seek after me. You got to come after me. That means that we got to be God chasers. That means that we got to get in pursuit. 
Not serve him when it's just convenient. Not serve him when we're in a jam or when we're in a bind and then we call on the name of Jesus. We can't use him as a sugar daddy, but we got to understand that he is the one that we ought to be going after. He ought to be the object of our affection. He ought to be the one that we're, we're, we're going, living for, and the one that we're, 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 we're chasing after, the one that, that we're going after. And when we're going after him, we understand that he's all that we really need. The problem is, Mother Blanche, is that the reason why we ain't, we ain't seeking after him is because we haven't come into the revelation that he's truly what we need. Because when you realize that he's all that you need, he becomes a priority. But if you think, no, it is this position that's going to bring me peace. It's this relationship that's going to do it for me. Oh, it's this stuff that I need. This, 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 this new house, this new car, these new things, this, 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 this clout, this, this, this privilege, this thing that continues to consume your attention and then you get the thing and then you realize that you're still empty you thought it was going to be the husband but then you get married and you realize I still feel some kind of way why do I still feel this way I thought this person would be the one to fill this void in my heart I thought if I get enough money, if my bank account got to a certain level, then I would have a, a peace in my heart. But you don't realize that none of that stuff can fill the place that Jesus is tailor-made for. He's the only one that can soothe your soul. He's the only one that can rock you in the midnight hour. He's the only one that can help you. He's a bridge over troubled water. He's a way out of no way. He is the rock of Sharon, the, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's a way out of no way. He really is all that we need. We need to get a new hunger and a new fervor and a new passion for Jesus. We have become too distracted in our society. We become too distracted in our society and we're going after everything. And now we are seeking first these things, hoping the kingdom will be added. But he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things shall be added. We're too distracted, Elder Robert. And I've come to share with you today, we got to get back to the altar. We got to get back to our place where we're spending time in the presence of God. We got to learn to lay prostrate on our faces. We got to learn to grab a hold to the horns of the altar and don't let go. We got to be like Jacob said, I'm not going to let go until you bless me, God. I got this need before you and I ain't going to let go until I get what I need from you. But it's a decision that you have to make to go after him. And when you go after him, you'll find that he's everything you need. It was Solomon. It was one of the richest men, the richest man in his time. When they estimate Solomon's wealth, he was a billionaire. Elon Musk billionaire, kind of. By that state, that standards of that time. He had all of the different accoutrements of life. He had women on top of women of all different sizes. And I'm sure he had the pick of the litter from different countries in the region. 
so he could call one in and tell him not to come back for 365 days and call in who he wanted. When Queen of Sheba came, the Bible says, when she saw the manner of his service and all that was under his hand, she said, the half has not been told. Solomon, it's recorded in Ecclesiastes. He looks at all that he has and he makes a declaration. He said, man, all of this is vanity. All of this, and I'm still empty. I got everything I ever needed. I didn't even know I wanted or needed some of the stuff that I had, but I have everything I ever wanted and needed. And it's vanity. I still feel like this. He goes further and he said, it's not just emptiness, Elder. But he actually says, it's more than empty. I got all of this, all of the money, all of the women, all of the fame, the fortune. He says, man, I'm vexed. He says, this stuff is vexation of spirit. Because he had left the commandments of the Lord. God told him, he says, don't marry all these women from all these other nations. Because if you marry them, they're going to cause you to become a whore. You are going to be aligned with their gods. When they get into your bed, they're going to get in your heart. And when they get in your heart, they're going to connect you to their gods. So now you're going to start to play in the harlot on me. You're going to start cheating on me. And so what he says, man, I got all of this. You know what he started doing? He started building temples to these gods, right? Yeah, he built the temple of the Lord, but he built a temple unto these other gods as well. Temple unto these other gods. And then he gets in Ecclesiastes, he says, vexation of spirit. I mean, I'm vexed. I'm the richest man, but I'm vexed. Because now I've gotten away on the most important thing in my life. It's Elohim. All I'm trying to tell you this morning is that Jesus is all you need. I said, well, Pastor, well, he all I need, I need a job. I didn't like that song. As long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. And I don't know all about that, that those words. I understood what she mean, meant. She could have said it a little different. As long as I got King Jesus, it includes everything I need or something. But what it's talking about is him being the priority. He says, if any man is going to come after him, let him deny himself. So you got to make a decision to go after him. The next decision that you have to make is to deny yourself because if there is too much you there will never be enough him if it's too much of you you can't see him you can't see him 
because all you can hear are your own thoughts. All you can follow are your own ways. In essence, we become our own gods. But when we come to him, he says, come unto me, all ye that labor in our heavy labor. And I'll give you rest. Hey, take a load off, dude. Come to me. Take a load off. Take this yoke upon you. Give me that yoke that you've been carrying, all that weight of burden. Take this yoke upon you. And learn of me. For my yoke is easy. Don't mean you're going to have no problem, but he's saying, listen here, you're going to take a load off. Because when you understand what I'm carrying, this thing going to bring you into divine rest. This thing is going to put peace in your soul and peace in your mind and peace in your household and peace in your finances and peace everywhere in your life. You're going to find rest. Take this yoke upon you and learn of me. That's why we go to sonship because we're learning of him. That's why we come to church because we're learning of him. That's why we go to Sunday school, Elder Teresa, because we're learning of him. You have to learn of him. He said, and then you shall find rest for your soul. You're going to find rest for your soul. It requires that you deny yourself. To deny yourself is to die to yourself. How do you deny yourself? You deny yourself by dying to yourself. Paul said, I crucify this flesh daily you come after him you choose him daily you deny yourself daily I was going to say something but I'm not I'm going to deny myself if I get this off my chest it's going to burden you So I swallow my pride and just take it. I was going to do something with this little I set aside, but there's a need. I'm going to deny myself and meet the need. I'll be all right. Didn't really need it anyway. God, if I was in charge, I would do it this way. But now I'm not in charge. I gave Jesus my life. So not my will, but thy will be done. So God, I'll go where you want me to go do what you want me to do say what you want me to say be who you want me to be and I choose it every day every day I guarantee that if you do those things that please the Lord he won't leave you won't he? but we have all of these other things that are priorities and then we wonder why we got so many problems because we want to come and just get an hour and a half on Sunday don't apply it and just hoping that some kind of way what I got in that hour and a half will take and will be the prescription for everything that's wrong it will if you apply it it will if you take it out of here and choose on Monday and choose on Tuesday and choose on Wednesday because religion causes us to come in and just come 
and get our weekly word and live like hell. That's religion. That's what we're used to. I just got my stamp. I went to church on Sunday, but the rest of my week I live like hell. And we just want everything to be all right because we paid our homage. But it's a choice that each of one of us should make and we should choose it every single day. If any man come after me, there's a command in the proposition. If you're going to follow me, come after me. Deny yourself, which is the die to self. He says, then take up your cross. Then you're ready to follow me. But you have to do that every single day. Every head bowed.